Hello everybody, and welcome to this week's Dry Dock. This is episode 244, and this week we're looking at questions taken from Guide 294 on HMS Neptune, Guide 295 on HMS Ramblies, Neptune being the unbuilt Neptune-class cruisers, and then we have two videos on firearms, all things, one on British naval small arms from World War I, and that was the collab with CN Arsenal, and then the trip I had up in Maryland, and then finally, U.S. Navy fleet problems from fleet problem 8 to fleet problem 12. So let's begin. Christopher Babylon asks, in your opinion as an engineer, just how effective and worthwhile were both the Neptune and Minotaur class designs? I think of the two, the Minotaur is definitely the better one. I actually broadly agree with the decision of the Royal Navy not to go ahead with the Neptunes, albeit they could have decided that a bit sooner. Because fundamentally what the Neptunes were was an attempt to do the town class only with better everything, including auto-loading main batteries. And if you have an auto-loading 6-inch battery, it's nice to have the same number of guns as your predecessors because that obviously then allows you to direct absolutely ridiculous amounts of fire downrange like with the Des Moines class. But... It's not necessarily 100% needed if you can drop the number of guns slightly and get almost as good a result in exchange for a bunch of savings. Now, by way of comparison, if you look at, say, Wichita, which is the obviously the last U.S. Treaty heavy cruiser, which comes in at 10,500 tons standard, and then you look at a Des Moines class, which is, you know, same armament but fully unrestricted you're looking at basically a 70 ish 70 percent increase in displacement now obviously you've got the baltimore sitting slightly between those two but the baltimores are treaty unrestricted so but with the royal navy you're looking at the towns and if you look at the difference that was projected for the neptune class then well even though they've gone up quite a bit, they are still not going up percentage-wise by the same amount. They're going up about 50% compared to a regular town and about 33-35% compared to Belfast and Edinburgh. And it, it kind of showed in the design. You know, they it, it just there wasn't enough room for everything they wanted. There wasn't enough displacement, there wasn't enough hull volume, there wasn't enough surface area. They would have been very crowded ships with very minimal capacity for upgrades. And instead, when you look at Minotaur, although Minotaur isn't actually all that much heavier, in fact, it's pretty much, um, when you're looking at Design Z Type D, the, about the same displacement as a Neptune, you have very different gun layout. So you've got the twin six inch instead of the triples, which makes the turrets much less complicated. It makes them individually lighter. And because you're using five instead, five twins instead of uh, four triples, you're only actually dropping two guns. And in exchange for that, um, you've also managed to get a better anti aircraft armament, arguably you've managed to get in just as many torpedo launchers you've managed to get in about the same speed you know armor wise i know it's a little bit of a joke in world of warships but armor is not that much reduced and to be perfectly honest in a post-war environment it doesn't matter quite as much as it did pre-war it's destroyer proof which is pretty much the important thing and admittedly, this is using a little bit of hindsight, but it is also, I think, much, much more adaptable. If you were to look at the profile of a Neptune class and try and think, how would you adapt this for future refits and environments, you know, where it might need to become a missile ship, or at least partially, or something like you have with Tiger and Blake, which are obviously historically had, had been built. There's so much superstructure to a Neptune and so little actual open deck space that it would have been quite hard, I think, to make the necessary adaptations. Whereas the min on the Minotaur, the overall superstructure, while it's still relatively busy, has been substantially reduced. You've got a lot more open deck space. 
Um, obviously, a lot of that is taken up with turrets. But, for example, if you were to do a, let's say, a 1950s, 1960s conversion, kind of like the US did, you could easily imagine taking off the aft turrets, the aft main turrets, retaining the forward turrets for surface action, shore bombardment, and the um, port and starboard anti-aircraft mountings, which you also wouldn't have to reduce or replace, which you would probably have to do with a Neptune, and sticking some kind of missile launch array for some of the earlier rather chunky missiles like sea slug on the back of a minotaur and as time goes on there's also a reasonable amount of space on the aft section there that you could put instead as again as things move on you could put a helicopter landing pad there as the three inch drops out of contention as a viable anti-aircraft weapon you've got things like Sea Cat and Sea Wolf, which in their initial form, Sea Cat certainly, and in and Sea Wolf in its early forms, are kind of actually designed to drop in as almost one for one replacements. So you'd be able to maintain short range missile defense. Although personally, again, especially with hindsight, I'd probably retain the forward pairs and maybe switch the aft pairs. And then if you really, really want to, um, if for some reason the Royal Navy is keeping the hulls around forever and a day, you could maybe replace the super firing forward six inch with some kind of 1980s VLS array or a twin arm launcher if you want to, you know, keep it a little bit further back for maybe sea dart launcher purposes or something. At which point, you probably keep the barbette structure for that super firing gun to get a better arc of fire and provide more space for a magazine. And you still have, even with that approach, as much gunpower as a Tiger class has originally for surface bombardment and shore action, you still have a forward set of three inch anti aircraft guns, which will be fairly useful in the Falklands. And you ha now have, you know, long range surface to air missiles, short range surface to air missiles, and the capability to use helicopters. So when you look at the Neptunes and think, well, what could you do? In a similar way, the Neptune's just not quite a, as adaptable a design. So, I think long term, the Minotaurs probably would have been the better ones to to do. Send Penguins asks: Was there a reason for the Royal Navy's preference for the six secondary turrets to be continue to be arranged three per side in their cruisers, instead of the U.S. Navy's hexagonal mounting arrangement on the Baltimores? Would the extension necessary to hull length really be that detrimental compared to the benefits of having an extra heavy anti-aircraft battery broadside during action? There are a number of design choices which in some ways reflect just different doctrines in a Navy, but also different operating environments to a certain extent. Um, the superstructure layout also to a certain degree influences things, plus how you're planning on accommodating other anti-aircraft weapons. Um, those are somewhat minor issues, the latter ones, though. The... The doctrine is a bit more of an issue because with the way the Baltimores, the Clevelands, the Des Moines, etc. are all laid out, if you were to look in profile, kind of a, a profile view with a cutaway, you'd see that there's actually magazine spaces scattered fairly evenly along the length of the ship. You know, so you've if in this case you're looking at Baltimore, so front to back you'd, you've got a pair of magazines for the 8-inch guns, then you've got a magazine for the central centerline 5-inch 38 mount, then you've got another one, then admittedly you have a little bit of a break, um, because in their wartime configuration you don't have anything in, in the middle there, although on a Des Moines you'd have uh, automatic 3-inch, then you've got, but you have the machinery spaces there, which are quite important as well, then you have another 5-inch 38, then the centerline 5-inch 38, then the aft triple eight, and then you're past everything. Well, everything explosive, at least. Now, with the British approach, as you see on the Towns and the Neptune design, although not so much on the Minotaurs, the, although they are spaced out, the uh, side-mounted guns, there is a little bit of space between their magazines and the magazines of the fore and aft turrets. Now, it might not be a tremendous amount, but it is something in terms of mitigating the risks of a secondary magazine goes up, which, you know, that's going to be pretty disastrous for the ship. But as you, you saw with Hood, it's even more disastrous if the main magazines go up. That is a relatively minor safety design contention. I mean, you could 
equally argue that, well, having eight guns, eight heavy AA guns on a broadside instead of six reduces the chances that you're going to take that kind of hit from an aerial threat in the first place, which you know, is fair enough as an argument. Um, doesn't do much for the surface gunfire argument, but I suppose maybe towards the end of the war that's becoming less of a concern. The other issue is the kind of combat environment you expect yourself to be fighting in. So for the US, finding itself fighting in the Pacific, you tend to have single large waves of enemy air, well not single large waves because that's a contradiction, but you tend to have a single threat vector at a time. The enemy aircraft will come in from a given direction because of the sheer distance of the Pacific, they will attack you, and then it will be over. So in that case, if you've got six mounts for your heavy anti-aircraft guns, having them arranged in a hexagonal layout so that you can provide the maximum amount of firepower within reason on a given beam is a good idea because it means you can shoot down the most aircraft that are coming at you. Whereas the Royal Navy experience in the Mediterranean and the North Sea with much closer ranges and therefore a lot more land-based aircraft coming in at any given time tended to show that you might be being attacked from multiple sides at any given time. And if you're being attacked from multiple sides at any given time, then, you know, the hexagonal approach of the US might not work out quite so well in your favor. In theory, yes, you can split your armament, you know, with three three mounts per, per side, but those fore and aft mounts are going to have less arc of traverse on your port and starboard sides and if one vector has opened up first it's highly likely that you're going to have your eight guns pointing that way and then someone comes in from the other side and now you've only got four guns pointing the other way whereas in the royal navy layout if you get swarmed you're going to definitely have six guns pointing in either direction which gives a slightly more balanced approach and these are some of the design considerations and arguments that go on in in the royal navy itself there are advocates within the royal navy for a more u.s style hexagonal layout because they think it you know a single heavier broadside is better but the idea as also mentioned with magazine layouts and so forth it wins out to return to the more traditional option Plus, there's also weight and balance and armor extension issues with pushing your main batteries further forward and aft than you strictly have to. Douglas Platt asks, A great deal of effort went into putting torpedo batteries on destroyers, cruisers, and capital ships for use in fleet battles. How many capital ships were actually torpedoed during engagements between surface ships? When it comes to capital ships, not a huge amount were actually hit by torpedoes launched by other surface ships. I mean, if you count surface ships from destroyers and upwards. If we restrict ourselves to battleships from, say, World War I onwards, I mean, Svent Isran is kind of a, a little bit on the edge because it's a Mars boat, so it's technically a surface ship, but it very much is a boat. Um, Scharnhorst, of course, uh, hit repeatedly by surface launch torpedoes uh, in well in several engagements um Gneisen how was not though bismarck of course was hit by surface launch torpedoes uh, a number of times then you have fuso and yamashiro of course in their final actions you do have a number a number more that were damaged um, by torpedoes from surface ships such as Marlborough and Seidlitz during the Battle of Jutland. And there is, of course, a few pre-dreadnoughts as well, like Pomerne, that were either sunk or damaged by incoming surface launch torpedoes. But, to be fair, the majority of torpedoes that hit battleships or battle cruisers tend to be either aerial or submarine-deployed torpedoes. The flip side, of course, is that there's considerably more cruisers and not a few destroyers that were hit by surface launch torpedoes um, fired off by various surface warships. So perhaps the very small pool of capital ships hit by other surface launch torpedoes is a little bit misleading. And obviously we're not factoring in um, torpedoes launched at crippled surface ships to sink them by their own side as, say, um, happened with Lutzow and so on and so forth so 
yeah, I, I, whilst it's not a huge number of actual capital ships hit hit and or sunk by them, um, without obviously going back and things like the Battle of Tsushima, you also have to bear in mind just how much additional equipment, how much displacement went into putting in the protective gear, bulges and torpedo defense systems and so forth. How many times were formations disrupted or ships turned away by the threat of torpedoes from Jutland, Leyte Gulf, you know, lots of different times that happened. Um, and sometimes getting the ships to turn away was just as if not more effective than actually scoring a hit would have been arguably in you know in especially in cases where the battleship could have perhaps pressed on and fought through a single hit or two plus of course the fact that capital ships now required by and large an escort from cruisers and destroyers to protect them from torpedo strikes from other surface ships so Whilst you might think that the effort is wasted when you just look at the number of ships that were actually hit, I'd say overall the amount of resources that had to be devoted into avoiding most capital ships from being hit by surface launch torpedoes, that probably paid off for the people who stuck torpedo launchers on their ships. Quizmaster China asks, Were the World War One era vessels still in service during World War II generally still in fighting trim or outclassed by technological advances and decrepitude? It varies quite a lot depending on what had been done to specific ships. Um, for the the large navies, at least, pretty much anything they had in World War One was still in service and not entirely decrepit, but a mixture of technological advances and specific kinds of refits had seen some of them pretty much relegated to second line duty right from the start so for example <clears throat> the fusos and yamashiros don't really do all that much apart from eventually sail out and get destroyed in the latter part of the war admittedly some of that is because the japanese insist on keeping them back for the mythical you know can't i guess and doctrine that never actually comes off but you know that's a separate issue then you've got for the in the royal navy the revenges um, and arguably possibly also Barham and Malaya really are confined for the most part to second line duties unless something gets really desperate like some t months in the Mediterranean and the Far Eastern fleet after the loss of Prince of Wales and Repulse. Likewise with the US, Arkansas, New York and Texas are pretty much on second line duties permanently. Um, Nevada and a lot of the standards once they're refitted and repaired also spend pretty much their entire life in world war ii on secondary duties but you do have some capital ships from world war one that through a combination of being some of the better capital ships of world war one plus need plus having been relatively extensively refitted or having you know, carry on capabilities do actually end up serving pretty much as frontline ships for some or all of the world war ii so the italian refits for example of the cavours and duilios they are i mean arguably still somewhat second line thanks to their relatively thin armor and relatively small guns but the italians do put them out in frontline roles for a while the British, as you can probably guess from the picture, they put War Spike Valiant and Queen Elizabeth out there. They put Nelson and Rodney out there. Redown, Repulse and Hood all get put out in frontline roles as well. Obviously, Repulse and Hood are lost in those endeavours. The US, mostly thanks to speed issues, doesn't, as I said earlier, doesn't tend to put their ships out on frontline roles. Their World War One era capital ships, although the Colorados do occasionally get a bit of a look in. Nagato and before she explodes Mutsu are both seen on relatively frontline roles for the Japanese but the consistent theme with all of the ships that are World War One era but still going on in frontline roles in World War Two is they're either the very end of the World War One era i.e. the immediate post-treaty or immediate pre-treaty era vessels and or they've been heavily refitted and modernized if they haven't been they tend to go straight to second line roles and stay there but there is one big caveat to all of that which is that in the early part of the war the 
various navies don't have much of a choice because most of them don't have any modern battleships in service. The King George V, the North Carolinas, the Yamatos, etc. You know, they they take time. They're not in service in 1939. Um, and for the Germans, you know, the Bismarcks aren't either. They're, yes, they've got Scharnhorst and Gneisenau just about, but still. Um, so necessity at first, but also there's not been this progression that you would have in the interwar period that you might na otherwise naturally have had. Because with the displacement limit being set at 35,000 tons and then 14-inch or 16-inch guns, depending on which bit of the treaty or escalator clause you're following the newer more modernized world war one ships can be made viable in everything apart from speed for most of them and occasionally speed for one or two of them so going toe to toe with the newer ships isn't necessarily out of the question for the better of the old ships whereas without that treaty um, in a more open environment where ships have been continually developed yeah, then you might be looking at something more like fleets of Yamato or Yamato equivalents, at which point there'd be no point. JJ asks, were there special versions of the bolt-action rifles from World War One for left-handed people? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Um, I mean, admittedly, I live in the UK, so I don't have quite the same level of exposure to firearms as perhaps some in the US do. But as far as I'm aware they don't do left-handed bolt actions um certainly not in that period um, i've never seen one in a museum for example they're they're just standard issue make um, now you can get left-handed bolt actions in something like airsoft for example um, i have one but i've actually spent so long learning how to use right-handed bolt actions the wrong way around that it's actually a bit difficult for me to work the um, a left-handed bolt uh, bolt action airsoft sniper rifle in a way that theoretically should be normal, but nonetheless, um, yeah. As to my knowledge, nobody outside of maybe the odd sports version ever made a combat rifle in World War One or indeed World War Two that was explicitly modified for left-handers. As I said, you, you could probably buy a custom-made one from the manufacturer uh, or get a local gunsmith to convert one, but it, it's not going to be widespread issue. If you were a left-hander in the Royal Navy at the time, you'd basically have to learn to shoot like I did, which, to be fair, I don't think I did too badly. Christopher asks, with regards to your comment on American-sized hands and everything in the UK being scaled down a bit, during the period the channel covers, was the British population isolated enough to experience insular dwarfism? No, I don't think so. Um, if, In fact, if you look at historical height levels in England dash the UK, I mean, you have to use England if you're going to look at it over a thousand years because... Obviously, Act of Union and all that doesn't come in until a bit later on. But nonetheless, if you look at the British Isles as a whole, the average height of the, your typical British male varies quite considerably over time. And it seems to track much more in the earlier periods with availability of clean water and food than the fact we happen to live on a relatively small island. Um, at times when po good quality food and clean water is in abundance the average english person is actually taller than quite a number of their continental counterparts but and there's a reason this particular picture is up once britain starts industrializing and britain starts industrializing fairly early and then goes for it in a really big way in the full in scale industrial revolution you see this rather precipitous drop in heights that goes down and down and down and down and really only starts recovering in the latter part of the 19th century as the benefits of the Industrial Revolution in terms of uh, plumbing, sanitation, more accessible food production, etc. They start to actually filter down through to the general population. And then the average height starts rising again. Ironically enough, the average height of the US and British male and female these days are, depending on the figures you look at, near enough identical, um, albeit they're a little bit lower than you might think they are. Um, apparently the average British and American male is five foot nine and the average British and American female is five foot three. 
Um, well, so there's kind of half an inch-ish plus minus on that, depending on exactly whose statistics you believe, in both directions. So I don't think it's the insular dwarfism argument, but I think that especially when you're looking at the earlier period of firearms, which is what we were doing in the, the video in question, you're talking about, A, an island that doesn't have a lot of space, generally, comparative to the US. So, you know, things in the UK being generally scaled down, I think, is more attributable to that, because if you've got less space, then houses and roads and everything are just going to be smaller, because you don't have the space to expand and have everything in. Um, whereas in the US... One thing you're not short of is space, generally speaking. And for you know the hand argument, I would say that you're probably looking at the fact that, as I said, Britain was hit the hardest in terms of overall quality of life and therefore body size um, of the industrialised countries. It was hit either the hardest or one of the hardest by prolonged exposure to that, the inequalities of that um, before the benefits kicked in. And so during that time period, you would have had a the development of early firearms in terms of early modern firearms that is as opposed to going back to medieval period the medieval period so the latin 19th century you would actually be scaling them for physically smaller people which is combined with this lack of space is one of the reasons why you get a lot of victorian era worker houses which are still around like you see in the photo and you go into them these days as uh well technically speaking above average sized british male um but more generally speaking probably around about i'm six nothing so you know not not terribly tall not terribly short and a lot of those victorian workers houses will feel somewhat cramped um it's just a little bit off i hate the dimensions of between nine and eleven feet if anyone's interested both as an engineer and as a human being they're just wrong nothing no human occupied room should be nine or ten feet or 11 feet anything by anything unless it's a corridor or a specific cubby hole room you know if if it's going to be a living space it's just the wrong dimension it's not quite big enough to be comfortable and it's just a bit too big to be um to, for, for you to ignore half the room in terms of furnishings but that's a slight aside max pax asks was the small lever loop on the winchester a bother hence why you gripped it i don't think so um i think that's just me being me because i actually have a co2 powered steel bb version of uh, the winchester back in the uk and having just run a couple of quick tests to see you know, you know put your fingers in it and use it the normal way or use it the way i use it um as you can see here i think the difference for me at least is that if my you know, trigger finger is there and then the rest of the hand is bringing the lever action down um, and then returning it my trigger finger ends up bumping things on the way down and or and all the way back up which obviously especially on the way back up may not be a wise thing um, whereas if I do it my way as you can see just using my thumb to work the action that forces my trigger finger away from the entire trigger assembly and it then has to be reinserted once the lever is back up in place which i suppose makes for better safety and it doesn't seem to reduce the much the rate at which i can actually cycle and fire the thing um but it makes me feel a bit better um i don't like the thought of potentially you know jamming accidentally getting my finger either jammed in some part of the mechanism on its way up or down or accidentally hitting the trigger um so yeah i i think that's that's just a, a habit of mine i mean it'd be interesting to see for those of you who actually do have one of these and use it on a regular or semi-regular basis how do you use it and do you have any issues similar to what i seem to sense i might have and hence adopt this slightly odd way of of doing things the hillbilly gamer asks how did they simulate hits and misses without lasers and radar did they shoot paintballs at each other out of eight inch or 16 inch guns did the aircraft drop paint bombs it varied somewhat over time um for aircraft it was quite often just simulated attack runs and then 
people the umpires would make judgments as to which attack runs they felt might have hit or missed and which aircraft they had or hadn't nominated to be shot down um, occasionally in exercises you would use dummy flower bombs to show whether a hit had been scored or not but obviously given the fact that you do have personnel even in a fleet exercise who will be out in the open whether they be anti-aircraft gunnery crew spotters um and range finders on the top of the masts people on the open bridges etc or people just generally moving around those could still be something of a hazard um in terms of the gun gunnery the u.s navy at first in the initial fleet problems operated on a mostly mathematical exercise where ships would point their guns at each other and declare that they were firing and then it would all be worked out by you know effectively dice rolls but part way through the fleet problems they adopted the british practice of offset firing uh, which i actually describe in one of the fleet problem videos and offset firing sounds a little bit um, dangerous and indeed it could be if you messed it up badly with offset firing what you do is you calculate your fire control solution as if you were actually going to shoot at the target and then you actually shoot at them um, usually with a practice shell but you can in theory use live rounds if you really want to um, but in any case you fire the guns but the difference is if you have take your calculations you add as the initial name suggests an offset so let us conclude for example that you are targeting a ship that is running parallel to you at 15,000 yards and you decide right so we're firing at 15,000 yards range and we're firing at say two degrees offset ahead to compensate for the fact the ship is underway that's what you would do if you actually wanted to hit the ship of course this is a training exercise you don't want to hit the ship so what you would then do is go for instance okay if we think the range is fifteen thousand yards and there's nothing immediately behind the target ship so we're going to elevate our guns to let's say eighteen thousand yards we're going to add a three thousand yard bracket offset to the range and we're going to double our lead from two degrees to four degrees so now in theory the shells should land at three thousand yards behind the ship and a couple of hundred yards ahead and then you fire so you get the full live experience of firing the guns and hopefully your offset is enough that you don't hit the target um, obviously uh, you have to have the offset great enough that errors in your aiming will be accounted for because if you say said oh well we're going to aim 500 yards over and half a degree ahead well your if your calculation was actually off by those amounts you might still end up hitting the ship so you have to offset by enough that it's 99.9 percent .9 you're not actually going to hit the ship and the advantage of this is not only is it much more realistic in terms of the experience of actually firing the guns but on the other end if you have observers and you know what your offset was in the first place especially if you have a standard set offset for the fleet so let's say you've shot with the intention of landing 500 yards forward and 3,000 yards over if your shells land and they're actually say 100 yards ahead and only 2,000 yards over then you know that if you'd fired that for real you would have landed short in both elements whereas perhaps if they land 100 yards ahead and 4,000 yards over then you know okay well it would have been slightly ahead and long if they land exactly 200 yards ahead but it's still 4,000 yards over okay well we've got the uh, rate of advance calculations right but we were a thousand yards over on the at on the distance and then you can revise your firing solutions pretty much as you would do in real life and again this makes hit scoring quote unquote much more realistic because all the umpires need to then do is look for shells landing in approximately the right place and then can go right well this salvo was actually on target and therefore we can now make a random estimation of how many hits from that salvo would have actually hit the ship and where they would have hit so that's a lot more accurate if a little bit more nerve-wracking and very complex to play out when you're looking at full fleet actions because in a full fleet exercise you have to take into account of all the other ships that are in the area so your offsets will get progressively more complex and a little bit wider 
Barley672 asks, Did the Royal Navy or Japanese Navy ever hold their own equivalent exercises similar to the US fleet problems? And if not, why not? I understand why smaller navies might pass up such complicated scenarios, but they seem like such useful learning experiences for big fleet operations. So they did. Um, they did hold big exercises. The Japanese tended to hold smaller formation exercises. That's why you have things like the Fourth Fleet incident when the Fourth Fleet is heading out for an exercise and gets hit by a massive storm. Um, but they do hold occasional full-scale fleet exercises. They are hampered somewhat by the fact that, obviously, they're involved in the latest season of the Sino-Japanese War for a considerable time before, conventionally speaking, World War II breaks out. But the Royal Navy does run full fleet exercises, or close to full fleet exercises. They're never quite on the same scale as the US fleet problems, because the Royal Navy has a lot more overseas commitments. So they might, you know, if you were, if you've listened to the Admiral Cunningham part two video, uh, you'll know that at points, Admiral Cunningham was with a squadron of cruisers based in the Caribbean, so they wouldn't be called in for fleet exercises. There would also be ships on the China station. There would have been a separate South America station for a while, although that got folded into the Caribbean and North America station during Admiral Cunningham's tenure on that station. Um, you've got cruisers stationed and various other ships stationed in the Indian Ocean, in the, South, in the Southern Atlantic around the South, South Africa area, and so on and so forth so as a proportion the number of ships that the british could bring to bear for a fleet exercise would be slightly less than the u.s navy could do in a good year when funding wasn't really a problem but what the british would do is they would have annual and occasionally semi-annual fleet exercises between the atlantic or home fleet and the mediterranean fleet which were the two biggest formations that the royal navy had and represented a good chunk of their combat power, um, so similar to kind of a mid-sized US Navy fleet problem, and then they would go and have specific exercises. They weren't billed in quite the same format, formal way that US fleet problems were. Um, they, they didn't sort of go, okay, well, we're going to examine this particular scenario of war between us and X power, the way that a lot of US fleet problems did, uh, there were the occasional ones that were a little bit pointed, but again, as you'll see in the Admiral Cunningham Part 2 video, it was more kind of generic. Here is one side, one one of the fleets, whether it be the Atlantic or Home Fleet, depending on what they were called at particular times, and they're going to be trying to do this, and the Mediterranean Squadron needs to stop them. And sometimes it'll be the Mediterranean Squadron is going to try and do this, and the other fleet's going to stop them. Or it might be, well, we don't have any particular objectives on either side, but there's this new tactic like night fighting that we want to test out. So have at each other and see how it helps, and so on and so forth. Because, as I've mentioned a few times in the past, the Royal Navy's war plans tended to be a little less complex than US ones. Um, they worked in more kind of overarching objectives and developing the skills to fulfill what might happen at the time, as opposed to the US Navy, which tended to be much more, well, we will do this, and then we will do this, and then we will do this, and then we will win. Um, very different doctrines going into the Second World War. Ash the Lego Guy asks, When I briefly lived in Savannah, Georgia, the Riverwalk area was paved with fairly regularly cut stones. I was told from two different local historians that these stones were ballast stones from military ships and the uniform size and density was so that the military age of sail ships could calculate and adjust balances faster than the merchant ships that just used any random rocks available. Was this the case or is this information of questionable authenticity? Uh, it's a qualified yes. So this is HMS Victory uh, down in the hold. Obviously they've partially, well, for the large part, actually, removed most of her ballast, but they've left left this kind of cross-section in place. And what you'll immediately notice is down there at the bottom, there are these kind of brick-shaped objects, and they may be brick, they may be cut stone, they may be pig iron, they could be all sorts of things in the Age of Sail. And then above that is this kind of loose shingle 
style stone that you'd pick up on almost any rocky beach anywhere. And then there's obviously the ship's cargo. Now, this is because Age of Sail ships have two kinds of ballast. There is the fixed permanent ballast, which is what's necessary to stop the ship from just tipping over at any given point. And then there is this live ballast, the ballast that may be adjusted at any given time. So that could be used to adjust the trim of the ship. It could be used to adjust the depth of the ship. And obviously that will depend on what status the ship is in. So, for example, if the ship has been uh, put in ordinary, so maybe the masts have been partially or wholly removed, um, all the armament is gone, most of the crew are gone, all the stores and supplies are gone, so the ship is riding quite light, you might have quite a bit of this loose shingle ballast just again to keep the ship from rolling over. Whereas once the ship is fully loaded with supplies, it's got the crew, the men, um, the masts, the cannon, etc. all aboard, that's quite a lot of weight, you know, weighing literally weighing the ship down, at which point you might need to reduce the amount of loose shingle ballast. So that will tend to be this very loose stuff. Sometimes it's called bag ballast because it might cut, turn up in bags rather than just in loose swathes like this. But the fixed ballast deeper in the ship, um, and on merchant ship, by the way, the live ballast would change even more because obviously they have huge cargoes that they may or may not be storing. Um, and they might also use the ballast itself as a commercial opportunity and you know, ballast down with bricks and sail to a place that wants bricks. But anyway, on a warship, the fixed ballast usually will be regularly shaped in some way, shape, or form. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be regularly shaped brick-like objects like there are here. Um, it could just be standard lumps of iron. In some cases, old worn-out cannon were used, and all sorts of things like this. And occasionally it would be you know, shaped or cut stone, but not uniform shaped or cut stone, but just generally cut stone that would roughly slot together. It really depends on what was available at the time the ship was being constructed, because when the ship's being built, that's usually when this fixed ballast goes in, and it doesn't really change or alter all that much. And of course, having fully formed, specific sized fixed ballast is a bit more expensive, so that's why it's not quite as common. But it is entirely possible that the fixed cut stones that you have seen in Georgia may very well come from a vessel. It doesn't strictly have to be a military vessel, but likely possibly to be a military vessel that had something like, as you can see with Victory here, some kind of fixed ballast of a uniform shape and size deeper within it. The thing that's probably not true, though, is that the idea that this allows the ships to trim much faster than most because that kind of ballast, the trimming ballast, the live ballast, that's something that, as we've just discussed, varies considerably over time. Even during a ship's voyage, it may be discarded, it may be moved. So if you're going to spend the money for very regularly cut ship's ballast, you're not going to use it on the live stuff. That live stuff is going to be bags of rocks, whatever ha you happen to have to hand that's easy to get in and out. J Mace asks, It's my understanding that the 8-inch gun turret configuration of the Lexington-class carriers was intended to defend them against surface ships, and that made me wonder, in their original configuration, how would the Lexington-class have fared against treaty cruisers? The Lexingtons do have a number of advantages when it comes to engaging a treaty cruiser. They've got a similar armament. Obviously, some treaty cruisers have 8, 9, or 10 eight inch guns but eight to eight inch guns on the lexingtons they're in the ballpark so they're not lacking in firepower they're obviously a much larger vessel so stability gun platform wise etc they have a number of advantages there admittedly the guns are mounted a bit higher so the effects of roll will be a bit more considerable but being a ship that's um 36 000 tons not really um it's a bit more resistive to most sea states in the first place then you've got the fact they're fast, so they're not losing out in the speed department compared to your average treaty cruiser. And armour-wise, the protection of Lexington's vitals is significantly in excess of any other treaty-era cruiser. 
I mean, it's slightly downscaled from what it would have had as a battle cruiser, but it's still significantly more <laughs> than a uh, county or uh, Pensacola or a Miyoko or whatever. So that's the good news. The bad news is it's a very big ship. It's a very, very big ship compared to a cruiser, and that makes it a little bit easier to hit. And, of course, that armor is down below. It's not protecting the hangar deck. It's not protecting the fighters. And in the interwar period, that means it's not protecting things like fuel lines and so forth, which we know were the cause of the demise of Lexington at Coral Sea. So, although it's going to be very difficult for a treaty cruiser that's engaging Lexington to actually physically sink her via direct shell fire, because at most reasonable ranges you can probably just tank hits to a belt armor fairly easily, and obviously in exchange Lexington can dish out a fair bit of damage, the problem is going to be the shells that hit above the armor belt. Because on a cruiser, a battleship, anything like that, you might disrupt the secondary armament, okay. You might smash up the superstructure, fine. You might demolish some fire control equipment, that's not quite as good, but backups exist for a reason. What you're very unlikely to do, unless of course you hit an aircraft facility amidships, is turn the entire upper part of the ship into a massive blazing inferno. And assuming this is typical operational conditions where Lexington's carrying a bunch of aircraft, it hits to the hangar from 8-inch high explosive or armor piercing shells are very, very, very likely to do that. And once you get a really serious hangar fire going and your damage control efforts are hampered by the fact that people are shooting at you, then you're in trouble. So how would they fare in a straight up fight? I think they would have an initial, if you're going one on one, you would have an initial advantage against an eight inch treaty cruiser. But you would be relying on utilizing your advantages to get the hits in that can drive off or cripple the enemy cruiser before it starts landing hits to that massive unarmored hangar deck. Because once that happens, you as the carrier are on a very, very, very short hiding to nothing. And that's not really good. Which is why the tactics for the Lexingtons were not to use their main guns in direct con conflict with cruisers in a straight-up gun engagement. The idea was to use them to force the enemy cruiser to stay at range, which would lessen the number of hits that it took whilst the Lexington wound its engines up to full speed and got the heck out of dodge. Ideally with its escorts playing, you know, keep away to make sure that that enemy cruiser did stay out of range once Lexington pulled out of range. Sam Signorelli asks, in post-World War II interviews with Japanese naval commanders, who were the most forthcoming with information, and what were their honest thoughts of the performance of the respective navies involved? Honestly, I don't think I can give you a particularly good answer for this one. I'm sure there's one out there, but I haven't really studied or looked into which particular officers, whether they be from the Italian, German or Japanese navies, were more or less cooperative with their interrogators in the immediate post-war environment than any others. Um, so as a result, unfortunately, that element of things, I, I can't tell you. Maybe someone in the comments who's looked into that in a bit more um, detail can. As far as what their honest thoughts of, of the performance of respective navies were, that to be fair, in the immediate post-war interviews, is a very subjective thing, because, I mean, you, you look at something like uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison's account, so he's writing the history of World War II for the US Navy, and we know now that a bunch of the stuff that he wrote is completely and utterly wrong. That's not because he was a bad historian, it's because he had a very limited amount of information to work with compared to what we have now, because a lot of the reports and so forth that have come to light since were restricted in various ways, shapes and forms, or obfuscated by propaganda. And that's the one who is ostensibly actually, you know, part of, well, not necessarily part of, but, you know, he's working for the U and with the US government and the US Navy. Now, if you look at in this case, there's questions about Japanese naval commanders look at the Japanese. They will have been subject to considerable amounts of propaganda from their own side. 
even though they are admirals and really should be presented with the the actual picture of what's going on plus they have a bit of a false idea of what their own side has achieved because obviously if a submarine commander comes back and says hey i killed a carrier well how do you prove otherwise <laughs> especially when all your recon planes are getting shot down and i mean obviously that applies to both sides everyone at the in the immediate post-war environment thought they'd killed a lot more of the enemy than they actually had and then of course if you're not going to necessarily be sharing actual loss data performance data etc with your own official historian you're much much less going to give a fully accurate picture of what happened to the u.s navy let's say to admiral ozawa um for example as a result i am at that point i don't think any of the post-war naval commanders especially from the axis side of things could really give uh, an accurate honest thought of the performance of the various navies involved because they really have no idea of apart from who won and who lost of what realistically actually happened so any thoughts that they did give i think i mean and i have to be honest i have read some of their reflections especially more from the german side of things a lot of their reflections in say the 1940 late 1940s unfortunately when you read them now you would look at them and go how how are you coming to these conclusions you're a professional but the simple fact is they don't have anything like the level of information that we have now um you know so admiral dernitz or admiral Rada can make certain assumptions about the effectiveness of the hillskreuzer the u-boats the japanese can make certain assumptions about the effectiveness of the kamikazes um, their submarines their surface ships etc or aircraft etc and the, so they can turn around and say well you know i think you did really badly here because you know you did this and we sank this many ships and damaged these others but us sitting back here now we're going well no you didn't you didn't actually do that so actually your assessment is entirely wrong um once you get into some of these officers with their later careers um, when they're writing memoirs and stuff in the 50s 60s even 70s some of them that is perhaps a, a slightly better time rather than the immediate post-world war ii interviews to look at to see what their honest thoughts of actual performance of the respective navies are and even then obviously there's still a degree of information that's no longer well that wasn't available to them then jao rita asks when did iron really start to replace bronze as the primary gun making material for naval guns it depends on the country but you can look at kind of the 1550s so the mid part of the 16th century as when iron cannon start to show up in very very large numbers aboard english at the time warships and gradually that technology to be able to reliably make cast iron cannon spreads and so depending on whether you're looking at the spanish french swedish etc etc navies when exactly they start introducing large numbers of iron guns will vary quite a bit from that point forwards but the largest and most important guns were usually still made of bronze for quite some time afterwards and that's in part because the process although the process of making a cast iron cannon is considerably cheaper than making a bronze cannon that's mostly because of the cost of the material the cost of the iron versus the cost of the bronze it's actually slightly easier for going from start to finish to make a bronze gun than it is an iron gun it's just the bronze is stupidly expensive compared to iron now the other thing is that if you do make a cast iron cannon and the iron fails that is a very very large very dangerous pipe bomb with a lot of very sharp bits of metal flying through the air hence why for the largest guns which are also the ones that are most difficult to actually make they tended to shy away from using the iron guns where they could for as long as humanly possible so that's why for example vasa although she is launched in an era that is well past the initial 
development of mass manufactured cast iron guns she still launches as a flagship with a full battery of heavy bronze guns because they're large guns they're prestigious guns and it's a flagship you do not want a 24 pounder cannon exploding on the deck of your flagship as it turned out didn't make much odds because she rolled over and sank but the logic was there and even if you look at the predecessor of hms victory the previous hms victory in the early 1700s when she went down her biggest guns on the lower gun deck were still bronze now granted it was the very tail end of that and the royal navy was shying away from equipping such even such ships with heavy bronze guns because partly the stupid amount of expense involved and partly because to be honest by that stage cast iron technology had advanced to a point they were probably not going to explode on you and this is why you, when you look at the mary rose wreck which is what you've been looking at here uh, in the mary rose museum you find on the mary rose a mixture of bronze and iron guns because there is this kind of crossover period going on although it should also be noted that um, on mary rose quite a number of the larger iron guns are made using the older literal hoop and stave method which is where you get the term gun barrel from in the first place so you're looking at essentially a 150 to 200 year transition from 1550 to the early 1700s where iron begins to take over in the terms of the mass manufactured smaller guns and gradually creeps up until it entirely supplants bronze by the middle of the 18th century david s speaks asks how efficient was naval gunfire i believe i heard you comment at one point that you average about three percent actual hits could you break down the efficiency of say world war one world war two etc by gun size 18 inch 16 inch 14 inch etc and perhaps by ship size battleships cruisers battle cruisers destroyers and maybe even by nation <laughs> i mean i could try um it would be a wednesday video and probably a fairly extensive one at that and it would definitely be a wednesday video with a huge amount of research that would have to go into it um plus there'd have to be a lot of caveats about the fact that you know obviously a battle that's fought in heavy weather at long range will result in a very different hit profile to a battle that's fought in fine weather at close range even if it's fought between the same two navies in the same year um and that's not even allocating for maybe the two battles involving different ships from different formations but yeah in in terms of efficiency as a rule of thumb somewhere between two and five percent hit rate would would be something that you could reliably count on for world war one and world war two there are exceptions to that obviously both in terms of being worse and in being considerably better but two to five percent and with an average of three to four percent if you're looking at a large scale battle would be a, a figure that you could reliably say i think this is roughly how many hits are going to be scored um yeah a, a, as for breaking down the efficiency basically what you'd what i'd have to do would be to i mean you'd be discarding data for, for first one thing because you there's no way well i suppose someone for a phd thesis maybe could do uh, but there's no way certainly for a wednesday video that i could track down every single engagement across world war one and world war two where shells were fired and then track the hit rates and you start all the calculations as a result of that even if all even if the records exist for those engagements which they may not um but say for the the larger engagements at least you could do that but even then you have to then factor in as i say not just potential modifiers like weather conditions sunlight etc um, but you also have to factor in different formations accuracy can be wildly different depending on who you're looking at so for example at the battle of jutland um, people like to go on and on and on and on and on about oh the, the germans had much better gunnery no actually they didn't if you actually look at the breakdown and that has been done uh, by campbell in his book yes the battle cruiser fleet is right down there at the bottom in terms of its main gun accuracy but the germans are then then occupying the spaces above the grand fleet actually has better gunnery than the germans do and fifth battle squadron when you look at it on its own it has better gunnery than everybody 
So the single most accurate people, you know, the gold medalists are 5th Battle Squadron, the silver medalists are Jellicoe's Grand Fleet. Um, if you want to go for individual ship medals, then Iron Duke is just heads and shoulders above everybody else. The Germans are in bronze and did not place with the High Seas Fleet and First Scouting Group. Um, although I think First Scouting Group does have a slightly better gunnery record than high, the High Seas Fleet generally. And then you've got, you know, the Wooden Spoon Award, which is the Battle Cruiser Fleet. But if if you average thing, this is the thing. If you average things out, so you average the battle cruiser fleet with the Grand Fleet with Fifth Battle Squadron, you'll get a very misleading idea of say what was happening in the run to the south. The German fi figures before the High Seas Fleet and First Gat Group are a little bit closer together, so it's um, a little bit safer to average them out. But it's still not brilliant. But then of course you have the risk of going the other way and overemphasizing things like you know you look at iron duke and say oh yes well clearly thanks to iron duke the entire british fleet must have had a 14 percent hit rate it's like no that is really not what happened or conversely look at someone that didn't hit anything and say the british couldn't hit the broad side of a barn from inside the barn which is also not accurate um so yeah basic answer already given but to actually break down the efficiencies that that's going to take a while and lastly for this week, Brandon Minders asks, what would be the top three most regrettable naval defeats in your mind? Regrettable from the view of the side that was defeated. Um, with some qualifications, it has to be a defeat. Um, heavy losses, although winning, don't count. Regrettable in the sense that victory could have been achieved for the lost side without too much of a change in history. And any change that has to be made within reason um, has to be not too far before the start of the battle being ambushed or surprise attacked doesn't count. Okay, so from the perspective of the side that lost, one easy one to go for is the Battle of the Barent Sea, which was Kriegsmarine versus Royal Navy. By all rights, the Kriegsmarine should have won that one. Look at the force balance. They have the preponderance of force. They have the preponderance of firepower. You know, the the skill difference between the Kriegsmarine sailors and Royal Navy sailors isn't exactly massive either way, or whichever one you think is better than the other. You know, the other one isn't that far behind. You know, the, I mean, everyone was slightly surprised by the outcome of, of Barent Sea because two heavy cruisers, including one of them being a panzer shift, versus two light cruisers, and then the German destroyers, on average, being slightly larger than, well, considerably larger than the British ones, in this particular case, they should have won. And the outcome of it for losing was Hitler flying into a complete rage and, well, forcing the resignation of Grand Admiral Reda because Hitler wanted to completely scrap every surface ship that the Kriegsmarine had and focus solely on U-boats. So, yeah, the Battle of the Barents Sea essentially ends the Kriegsmarine as a surface war fleet, even though Dönitz, a raider successor, manages to persuade Hitler not to scrap the entire surface fleet. The Kriegsmarine, after that, is essentially reduced to gunfire support operations in the Baltic, the U-boat campaign, and being a fleet in being in Norway to keep some Allied warships tied down until tall boys show up. And that's all they're left with really so i'm pretty sure the case marina quite regret that and it should have been a fairly easy win another regrettable defeat would be the battle of virginia capes at the end of the american war of independence so the british at that point facing off against the french now given that this is the royal french navy not the napoleonic era french navy and given the numbers at and firepower balance on hand still going to be a fairly close fight but there were a number of mistakes that the british made that if they did not make them um they could have won the battle i mean as it was it was still a relatively close run thing but if the british had won the battle then they would have been able to resupply cornwallis um on land who was obviously in the middle of being attacked by american and french troops if they'd been able to supply him with food ammunition perhaps even a naval brigade perhaps even offshore fire support or perhaps the naval brigade comes with, with some guns from the ships then well the american war of independence wasn't exactly going particularly fantastic for the british but 
they the, the York Battle of Yorktown is quite rightly seen as something of a turning point, and part of that was because Cornwallis knew he wasn't going to get rest, resupply, aid, etc. from the Navy because they'd lost Virginia Capes and weren't able to dominate the area. So if the British had won the battle, would they have necessarily been able to keep hold of the American colonies, the 13 colonies? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they would have been able to keep some of them. Maybe eventually they would have been driven out and not been able to keep any of them. But in terms of this was a fight where you can point to say, well, here is actually where the dominoes really began to fall. That's a fairly regrettable loss for the Royal Navy. Now, coming up with a third one, it can be a little bit difficult because some of the more obvious ones that you might think would be a very regrettable and indeed are regrettable in a certain sense for their navies. Tsushima, for example, Trafalgar, etc., the Armada. Those are regrettable, but almost all of those kind of major defeats, really, when you look at them, you can trace back the win or loss of that battle to months, if not years, before that fight actually happened. You know, it's it a battle that was already decided, it just took both sides to show up to realise what was going on. I suppose if you want to throw a wild card in there, you could probably say something like Actium. Um, Actium is kind of the death knell for the ambitions of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and by Octavian and Dash later Augustus actually winning, that sets the stage for the entire Imperial Roman era, so that's a fairly major event in history. Who knows what the, well, dying Roman Republic dash nascent Roman Empire would have been like under the control of uh, Mark Antony and his descendants, rather than Octavian dash Augustus. And that fight, as I covered in the Battle of Actium video that I did, whilst it's a little difficult to work out what on earth was actually going on there, from the most likely evidence, it's entirely possible that with a little bit better coordination, a little bit better tactics, Mark Antony's fleet might actually have been able to pull off a win. Um, there's a number of options they could have done to do so. It didn't happen on the end at the day, but you know, the butterfly's wings here or there, and it, the entire history of the Roman era could have been very, very different. Well, congratulations, you've reached the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. Next week, of course, it shall be the Patreon Dry Dock. So hopefully you're looking forward to that. And if you're not, well, you now have advanced warning. In any case, see you again in another video.